It should be obvious to all of my long-term listeners that while this show is nominally about physics, science and technology, that hasn't really ever stopped me from publishing episodes in basically any format and about anything I would like, including the careers of Louisiana senators and philosophical discussions surrounding immortality that really have got very little to do with the core themes here. It's the kind of thing that I think I can just about get away with because I never know how many people are listening. This is an independent show and I assume that you all are happy to listen to various different kinds of content and have an open mind about these things. So in that vein, I'm going to release something a bit unusual today, which is essentially going to take the form of an eclectic mix of various bits and pieces. Some music, some prose, some poetry, some vaguely scientific reflections, some from me, and a few things from other people as well. It's an experiment, really. For that reason, this show won't be for everyone. If anything, it's mainly for my high school and sixth form English teacher. If you'd rather listen to something that's a bit more usual from this feed, we have 100 plus other episodes and more on the way, so just wait for one of those or go back into the archive and find something that looks interesting. If you think this is going to be too pretentious for you, then you're probably right. But if, on the other hand, you're willing to take a chance on something a bit more unusual, then stay with it. So we're going to start with something that I wrote about going to the supermarket, which used to be a wonderfully mundane affair, and as I'm recording this in the middle of May 2020, is a slightly less uh, usual thing and a bit more exciting these days. It's called Heading to the Supermarket. Out the front door with its protesting paint and around, past the pedestrian crossing gods that move in mysterious ways, stopping and restarting time for each of us like mischievous, partial sprites. Towards another congregation where we can shuffle and dance, bathed in our own glaring light, the motion of the warm bodies, the silences, in ones and twos they came to the altar. There were no prayers of worship, and today's hymnal is the preponderance of desires to be elsewhere in some imagined place where no aches of body or mind can follow. The rhythmic beep is a lull to the sleep without rest, medicated faint yellow, the hospital gown, as the fever breaks at the loudest squeal of midnight, and we click shuffle dance again, the last light at the office and the last rites in the churchyard, remembering the halcyon polaroids of memory we provide ourselves for comfort. This is what we dream of when we wordlessly, functionally stack the items on the conveyor belt and watch them shudder past as we... Observe from scene to scene, flickering, a cigarette half extinguished in the room's eerie glow. No one will ever have or want to know. This forgotten time which no narrative permits, underwater, sleeking with the shoal of fish. When we all do what we must to remain alive and wait for a god we suspect won't arrive. What deity would deign to see us here where exhaustion's just another career? If a supervolcanic eruption, Pompeii froze us in time, this is how we'd be, humble servants trying to get by, and the infinite kaleidoscope behind your eyes is as lost to the ages as the first spark that set the whole circus going. Almost already gone, stare ever upwards at an endless sky. It can't give you answers, it won't explain why. But it's beautiful, all the same. The trap of home. This is something that I wrote when I found a weird file on my computer. Did you know that computers dream too, just like we do? I recently lost a whole load of work due to stupid backup and saving habits, and I had to retrieve it via a dodgy third-party piece of software that scrubs the unallocated portions of your hard drive for anything that looks like a text file. I managed to eventually recover the work, but the software generated a vast number of other text files, a lot of them impossible to interpret and filled with code and various fragments of things that had been dredged from some unknown corner of internet history, but when I was searching I found this one. It seems to be a list of things that I have searched at some point, but the times when I searched for them are various and widely distributed. I mean, there's certain people who I know I might have searched for a few months ago, and also Roman figures and actresses and things that I wouldn't have searched for for a very long time based on when I was interested in those particular shows. And some people I know who I'm always looking for, I have no idea what links these words. I have no idea why the computer's random consciousness threw them together into this list that seems to say an awful lot about me, why they are almost all nouns or adjectives and not conjunction words. I don't know what mechanism this was. It seems to be like a dream, the computer's subconscious randomly throwing up aspects of an imprint that I left on it. And of course, in a sense, you can argue that it's poetry like everything else. It seems to summarise things in an unbiased way. It summarises me in an unbiased way, free of the artifice of the selection of the right words and things that I would want you to see. If I died tomorrow on this ageing hard drive, who knows how many hundreds of such files might exist, stored deep somewhere, difficult to retrieve, everything that's been typed or dreamed of or searched. In the modern era, we're all unconsciously pouring our souls out through these machines, into these machines, all the time, constantly, and our ghosts are left there, sifted and sorted and compiled and filed in arcane and unknowable ways to us. Or perhaps it's the vast engines of the attention and surveillance economy that hopes to one day harness these ghosts and convert them into profit. 
In all likelihood, the list of search terms has arisen due to some unknown cookie monster that has burrowed its way into my browser, waiting like the Babelfish to try and convert these words and phrases into means of selling me something. In a weird way, it's entropic, but there is recoverable information here. You could learn something surely from this random list, and this is how you might try to rebuild. Just in the same way as I rebuilt my file, stitching together the little fragments I could find, trawling around in unused or underused disk space. And there was a poetry to it. So here's the list that I ask you all to forget. Achaemenid, R, Cincinnatus, Coriolanus, Corellis, Corrigan, Cumberbatch, Danielle, Eddington, Elagobolus, Eugenides, Eurovision, Hamid, Higgs, Kyrios, LHC, Lemington, Magellanic, Mullaney, Messalina, Northumberland, Piles, Podcastle, Pompey, Pseudopod, Schlieffen, Sith, Spiritualized, Sermidorian, Ultra High Energy Cosmic Rays, Unironical, Animalistic, Anthropic, Astroturfed, Audiobooks, Blog, Bludgers, Britain, Clickable, Demonized, Emotionlessness, Employability, Emptively, Excitability, Favor, Favorite, Favorites, Heartedly, Homonym, Honor, Horsemeat, Humor, Immersive, Incentivized, Intentioned, Isotropically, Labor, Magellanic, Magnetar, Magnetars, Marvelous, Me, Misattributed, Mistranslating, Multiverse, Nauseam, Non Sequiturs, Online, Podcasters, Projectors, Relatable, Relatable, but spell wrong, Renewables, Should've, Sidedly, Sieged, Sludging, Synchronicity, Texting, Transferal, Transformative, Travelled, Trivial, Uncaringly, Undeliverable, Underprepared, Unknowable, Unlikeliness, Unoriginality, Villanelle, Villanelle, spelled wrong, Checksum. A proverb. You can avoid having regrets on your deathbed if you die standing up. I wrote a love poem about the theory of gravity. It goes like this. When I was young, I learned that things, when not supported, fall down and go to ground. I watched the leaves fall and wondered why the stars didn't. When I was older, I learned that there was a force called gravity, and every object attracted every other object with a force proportional to the inverse square of the distance between them, and I thought how amazing it was that every object in the universe knew the contours and the distribution of everything else. And I thought how funny it was to say that I was attracted to you and that you were attracted to me, and to calculate that infinitesimal but real force that brought us together. When I was older, I learned that Newton's laws of gravity were just an approximation, a limit, a corner of a grander theory, general relativity, and that it was more accurate to say that bodies didn't pull on each other but instead bent the fabric of space-time, such that the geodesic, the path of least resistance, brought us all inexorably together. And I thought how cute it would be to tell you that I was warping the fabric of space and time to keep us together. And only later did I realise that the Earth loved you with a force I could not match. When I was older, I learned that things, when not supported, fall down and go to ground. I watched the leaves fall and wondered why the stars didn't. So uh, what follows here is a quote from a Wikipedia article about a philosophy I don't exactly agree with, but which is certainly good for provoking conversations. It's on the page about antinatalism, which we could talk about for ages, but I'm just going to leave you with this particular quote. Peter Wessel Zapf viewed humans as a biological paradox. According to him, consciousness has become over-evolved in humans, thereby making us incapable of functioning normally like other animals. Cognition gives us more than we can carry. Our frailness and insignificance in the cosmos are visible to us. We want to live, and yet because of how we are evolved, we are the only species that, whose members are conscious that they are destined to die. We are able to analyse the past and future, both our situation and that of others, as well as to imagine the suffering of billions of people, as well as of other living beings, and feel compassion for their suffering. We yearn for justice and meaning in a world that lacks both. This ensures that the lives of conscious individuals are tragic. We have desires, spiritual needs which reality is unable to satisfy, and our species still exists only because we limit our awareness of what that reality actually entails. Human existence amounts to a tangled network of defence mechanisms which can be observed both individually and socially in our everyday behaviour patterns. According to Zapf, humanity should cease this self-deception, and the natural consequence would be its extinction by abstaining from procreation. This is a joke. Two cows are standing in a field, one of them asks the other, have you heard about this new mad cow disease? And the second replies, Yeah, but I'm not that worried about it, given that I'm a helicopter. 
I'm now going to play you an honest to goodness remix of me talking that was made by Naomi, who listens to the show. Uh, thanks for spending your time making this thing. I hope everyone enjoys it. There's a little room in a little second-hand bookshop in a little town in Wales called Hailmwine, which was very much like the TARDIS, because it was so much bigger in terms of the book content on the inside than it seemed on the outside, and all of them selling for pennies. stories about the three laws of robotics. Do you remember them all? Robots will defend themselves. It was there that I was introduced to the dystopian futures of 1984, Brave New World, Fahrenheit 4.0, and all of them sell it for pennies. Do you remember them all? Rule number one. No robot shall ever harm a human or allow a human to come to harm. Rule number two, robots will obey human orders, except where it contradicts law one. And rule number three, robots will defend themselves. second-hand bookshop in a little town in Wales called Hailmwine, which was very much like the TARDIS, because it was so much bigger in terms of the book content on the inside than it seemed on the outside. As long as it doesn't result in humans coming to harm instead of them. This is an extract from a long letter that I wrote to my friend a couple of years ago where I was just riffing on various philosophical speculations and trying to be funny. I'm reproducing it here because it's a little bit like something we would normally talk about on this show, but in a totally different tone of voice, and maybe people would enjoy that. Quote. Speaking of parallel universes, I've had to deal with some real nonsense lately because of the dangerous crowd that I've fallen in with. Some people take a wrong turn and end up in street gangs or high on mescaline, but my fate is far worse. I've become encumbered by pop philosophers, and it's quite possibly a fate worse than death. I'm sure you're already aware of the simulation argument by which we're supposed to conclude that we are all almost certainly living in a simulation, because if simulation's as detailed as our universe, or in the weaker, last Tuesdayist formulation, I guess just our subjective experience, can be concocted at some point in the future, then presumably it would make sense for future civilizations that might be descended from us to run countless of these simulations. Simulations of their ancestors, adding in dumb, stochastic variables like making reality TV stars president just for shits and giggles. At which point you go, aha! Trillions of simulations, one reality. One divided by trillions is, like, really small, so I guess we're probably in a simulation. Unless, of course, you disagree with one of the fairly reasonable-sounding axioms that was laid out at the start of the argument. Okay, fine. I guess, as unfalsifiable theories go, it's all very entertaining and probably slightly more fun than invisible pink unicorns or badly misplaced crockery, but it does seem to lean rather heavily on the blah infinity, and it's also substantially more profound at first glance than it is when you really stop to think about it and dig into the troubling fridge logic consequences. As in, it's a perfectly good thing to debate when you're slightly inebriated, and I suppose if it makes you feel better about your own perceived failings to imagine that you're in a simulation where your descendants try to fathom the horror and tragedy of a world where you don't become eternal galactic president for life at the age of 21, but it doesn't really answer any questions. If anything, it makes the whole endeavour seem rather more pointless than it was before, which I suppose could also be a criticism of some religions. Is it really better to live by the logic of some patriarchal beardo with a strange obsession about arcane forms of cleanliness, cloven hooves and people's bedroom activities, or by my own logic, where, if truly unfettered by any social, societal or personal expectation, I'd probably just read Wikipedia until I starve to death. But the idea that you can then conjure up another infinity and argue that we're also infinitely likely to be extras in another person's simulated story or worse, that it's possible that the main action sequences don't even take place on our planet, 
and do so ad infinitum is kind of sad. But the simulation drunken pub argument is as nothing compared to the horrifying world of the Boltzmann brains. I mean, my god, this is just this kind of stuff taken to whole new levels of nonsense, and they add in some pretty dodgy physics to make it sound more plausible, that instead just sort of makes it seem like a badly plotted Doctor Who episode. Here goes. Imagine we live in an infinite universe, and by infinite I'm not messing around here, none of this is far of the eye can see nonsense that we have at the moment, where it appears that likely that, for example, the speed of light times the age of the universe is substantially smaller than the real universe's real horizon. No, I mean the universe is infinite, and that it therefore also contains an infinite amount of matter and energy and all the other delicious stuff. And it's also static, not expanding, not contracting, and so on. I suppose given an infinite length scale, the infinite time scale might seem to be a moot point, but while we're adopting axioms that render everything trivially true via magic, we may as well add in another one. Time essentially matters only locally and not to the whole, which will always be the same infinite soup as it was before. Once you have this as your first, extremely unlikely, difficult to justify postulate, then you can simply and smugly divide by infinity in all circumstances to get zero. Or more accurately, you can multiply infinitesimally small probabilities by infinity to get into certainty that every conceivable event not only occurs, alongside all the inconceivable ones, but does so infinitely many times. In the simplest construction, then, you might imagine randomly fluctuating molecules that spontaneously, improbably, but with my big old infinity to wave around and no indecent exposure please present, with inexorable certainty, spontaneously, through chance, these molecules will assemble themselves into the shape and form of a working brain that's currently having the misfortune of listening to this garbage. The brain might be in the vacuum of outer space, or in a vat that also spontaneously forms, or a full person in an entire Boltzmann universe, just like ours. Thanks to the majesty of infinity, it must also occur that the second you finish reading this sentence, your molecules spontaneously rearrange themselves into a giraffe, or that the air molecules around you spontaneously, and through a series of ridiculous coincidental energy transfers or cosmic ray bombardments, rearrange themselves into sound waves such that this letter is being read out to you instead in Scarlett Johansson's voice. Invent your own ridiculous fantasy scenario. Maybe in some of them they even came up with a good ending for Game of Thrones. The conceit goes, then, in full reducto ad absurdium glory, that we cannot distinguish our subjective experience from that of a brain that happens to have just spontaneously formed in the ether, that is currently in the precise bioelectrochemical arrangement that corresponds to you experiencing whatever it is you're experiencing right now, which is doubtless, if you're listening to this, somewhere closer to abject misery than extreme erotic excitement. Not only can you never distinguish your experience from that of a brain that's momentarily formed, and here we enjoy some more Last Tuesdayism, which isn't exactly new. But in fact, since that individual brain is much easier to form, and hence much more likely to form, than a whole coherent universe with, you know, a planet, Earth, and oxygen, and so on, in some sense, the uncountable infinity of Boltzmann brain versions of you that will immediately dissipate after the subjective moment is larger than the uncountable infinity of fully human versions of you that actually live in an actual Boltzmann-assembled universe somewhere. Ergo, you must conclude that when you're listening to this right now, you are in fact extremely likely to be a Boltzmann brain, and therefore you will dissipate instantly. But there's no need to even worry about the continuity of your consciousness or whether you're going to die in any sense, because another Boltzmann brain will form that takes over from where you were, only a fraction of a microsecond later, and so on, forever and ever, amen. The concept of Boltzmann brains, as you might expect, was originally developed as a reducto ad absurdum argument. So, for example, it's supposed to disprove the idea that you have an infinite static cosmology. And it says all of your dumb infinite static cosmologies cannot possibly be true, otherwise there would be billions of these uh, um, improbable events occurring every second, and you'd have to conclude that you are a Boltzmann brain, floating momentarily in the vacuum of space to ponder on the philosophical implications of one's own cosmological assumptions before dissipating into the void, and then, of course, in classic reducto ad absurdum arguments, you can say, that would be absurd, and therefore it did not happen. Obviously, it now stands as one of the many asinine but nagging philosophical puzzles one can consider, alongside whether we're all in a simulation, whether we were all created yesterday and implanted with false memories, whether we effectively die whenever we fall asleep or lose consciousness, etc, etc, etc. Ludwig Boltzmann discovered the second law of thermodynamics, the fact that time essentially flows and is in a real sense defined by the increase of disorder and chaos, and then he killed himself. Which may indeed make sense. 
Although, while physicists like to romanticise this as Boltzmann responding to the existential terror of a universe doomed, despite the efforts of all humanity to subside into a meaningless, maximally entropic state, I heard that his biographers think it was more to do with his wife having an affair. You can be smart and unhappy for different reasons. In fact, this is probably easier. Had he realised, though, that some people would eventually take Boltzmann brain seriously and look deeply into the consequences of such idle and worthless speculation, to the extent of actually publishing scientific papers on the matter, albeit not in the most reputable of journals, he probably would have killed himself all over again, existential crisis or no. The kind of speculations that people are engaging in, in particular surrounding AI, always amuse me, because in some sense they're just theologies returning under another guise, anthropomorphising things that we've already decided are beyond our comprehension and so on. One particular fear is that we might create a superintelligent AI. Whenever you see superintelligent AI read man-made God, as there are no limits to its capacity that are ever realistically imposed in a lot of these vaguely defined scenarios. And then we might tell this God to make us happy. Then it would simply decide that the best way to do this would be to inject us all constantly with heroin or upload our brains to a simulation where all we ever do is tickle the pleasure circuits eternally and without end. Indeed, it might go further and decide to convert all of the matter and energy in the observable universe into hedonium, computing materials that just simulate these grinning idiot humans for all eternity. You can call it the universe of masturbation if you like, because it's self-pleasuring that short circuits whatever the pleasure incentive is supposed to be there for. It's deeply philosophically unsatisfying, and so most of us instinctively shun the idea that this would be a good outcome. A universe filled with computers simulating the most basic of human minds experiencing an endless, unsatisfying orgasm for the rest of eternity. But when asked to explain why this would be such a terrible outcome, we run into the same fundamental difficulties in defining what good is in the first place. Is good something you have to earn, and if so, how? Does it rely on complexity and con contrast? Does it need to if you remove all of the constraints on how your brain might function such that it no longer needs to rely on a complex set of things that make you feel happy or contrast between happiness and sadness? But the funniest thing about this hypothetical universe is that the people who spend hours pontificating and imagining and writing weighty treatises on the universe of such things do not realise that they have sort of already created it. Simply look around you at your fellow philosophers and there you will find it. It's all very well to abstract yourself away from reality to that extent, and pretend that taking actions such as speaking to your children or helping those in need are as nothing as compared to the grand philosophical importance of typing into a flannel in a little room in Oxford, but ultimately it's still the idea that eats smart people. The utilitarianism of it can kind of drive me up the wall. Ditto Silicon Valley hyper-enthusiasts who worry that a misaligned AI might represent a system that humans have designed that ends up growing complex beyond their understanding and has a goal that is only partially correlated with what humans really want, and this miscorrelation leads to tragedy and disaster when the thing is unleashed on the world. Like, hello, GDP growth in the West was once correlated with the Genuine Progress Index, which measures human achievement in a slightly more well-rounded way, but that stopped being true after 1980. And now we're focused on maximising something that is imperfectly correlated with what humans really want. This is not some hypothetical future where we've developed a system that we've designed that's grown complex beyond our understanding and has a goal that's miscorrelated with what we really want. This is basically every system of human governance that has ever been developed, so you better start believing in ghost stories because you're already in one. Yeah, you can imagine that it's always fun to get a letter from me when I'm in that kind of mode. I mean, what are you supposed to say to that other than good? So uh, I wrote this about spring cleaning my room one summer, but of course it's also about being nostalgic for being young and foolish and in love. It's called Nightlight. Spring cleaning in summertime I found you, strange artifact with tiny yellow bulb, the head end of an adjustable tube of a neck. Ah, I remember now. This clip here between the pages. It was a nightlight to allay maternal concerns. If you stay up all night reading, at least use this to light the pages up. Words by moonlight will strain your eyes. The theory of vision as some battle between dimly lit reading, which blinded you, and carrots, more effective than any night vision goggles, seemed unrealistic. I put it in a drawer and forgot it. Besides, I secretly harboured a suspicion that if my looks could be salvaged I'd look better peering inquisitively over the rims of glasses that filter and refract the photons into your eyes. This would form a sort of defensive layer against the things that were and weren't said and the things that were and weren't done. Back then I was just beginning to understand. An absurd metal heart in a faux velvet box whose distant bells chime when disturbed. Lenses barely change how the world sees you, but in the lenses are the world you see, and through such wondrous frames, oh, did the light of the world seem to twist and bend. Starshines gathered behind the shape of you and shot their little hooks into me, and so, wherever I went, I saw the glowing strings connected us, and this is what I saw through the lenses. 
Staring directly, the sun seemed dim in those heady, hazy, punch-drunk days. It seemed absurd that no one had noticed that eclipse that outshone the galaxies. And so this was a new way to spend the night, searching after different words to say, until making out the story I'd written it to be was too much strain for the lenses even to bear. Entropy makes clear outlines smudge and fade. Tidying up ultimately just rearranges the dust to no particular effect. But it's all we know to do, so let's resume. The glasses belong in the drawer, with the light. My uh, walk to lectures was basically designed to make you think about mortality back in the day, and I wrote this on one of those walks. This is because on your right side there's a museum, the Natural History Museum, and one called Pitt Rivers that essentially contains all of the various loot that has been stolen from different places around the world, and there are always groups of schoolchildren touring there, so you can see a vast horde of little kids playing on the grass, screaming, shouting, fighting, frolicking, causing mayhem. Which is usually a sight to make you think about innocence and the brevity of it and your own childhood and so on. And on the left side there's a main road that's always busy and contains a lot of cyclists, and there's a bunch of flowers tied to the bottom of a tree that is continually being replenished by somebody in memory of, we can only assume, so it's already set up to trigger a contemplative mood, but over the last week all of the leaves have suddenly started jumping from the trees. It's one of those places. Autumn is very, very sudden, and so everywhere you look there's spiralling gold and brown leaves twirling prettily in the sickly morning sunshine to be trampled underfoot and under bike by students and lecturers. This is in the middle of the pavement, so there we have it, from left to right, or perhaps from right to left, past, present and future. In the way that these things sometimes do, the leaves suddenly become very symbolic, and that's where I am now, twirling in the sky, briefly, en route to a destination wondering when and where I'll end. Anyway, I was walking in the same road a few hours later and came across some tiny children gathering these self-sown leaves in their arms, collecting them, and one of the children said to the other, we're a team, aren't we? We're a team. Children don't have the same inhibitions about saying things or about revealing insecurities as we do when we grow up. I think this is part of what triggers the protective instinct when we see them, when we think about them. It's what triggers me to feel happy but also horrifyingly upset when I see children playing and think about the world they might inherit might grow into, and the world as they see it now, and the differences between them, if we take the wrong decisions. And although we have often trained ourselves to neglect it or suppress it or ignore it, the same desire for reassurance is in all of us when we look around, each to each. We're a team, aren't we? We just don't have the balls to say it. This is something very short. The difference between believing in nothing and believing in something is like the difference between skydiving and being chucked out of a plane. It's all in how much you enjoy your descent. Thanks very much for indulging this. I'm going to leave you with some glorious music from Melody Sheep who do the theme for the podcast. Remember, you can find the show on the web at physicspodcast.com. There's a contact form there where you can tell us how much you either loved or hated this little experimental format. Probably won't be coming back for a while because it takes many years to accumulate this kind of writing for me. I don't produce it very often. Um, we'll return to more regular programming soon. Until next time, then, take care.
all connected to each other biologically, to the earth chemically, to the rest of the universe atomically. I think nature's imagination is so much greater than man's, he's never gonna let us relax, relax. Where things change all right, but according to patterns, rules, or as we call them, laws of nature. I'm this guy standing on a planet. And really, I'm just a speck. I'm just a speck compared with a star. The planet is just another speck. To think about all of this, to think about the vast emptiness of space. There's billions and billions of stars. Billions and billions of specks. The beauty of a living thing. Not the atoms that go into it, but the way those atoms are put together. The cosmos is also within us. We're made of star stuff. We are a way of the cosmos to know itself. Across the sea of space, the stars are other sun. We've traveled this way before, and there is much to be learned. We're all connected to each other biologically, to the Earth chemically, to the rest of the universe atomically. I find it elevating and exhilarating to discover that we live in a universe which permits the evolution of molecular machines as intricate and subtle as we. in my body are traceable to phenomena in the cosmos. That makes me want to grab people in the street and say, have you heard this? The beauty of a living thing is not the atoms that go into it, but the way those atoms are put together. The cosmos is also within us. We're made of star stuff. We are a way of the cosmos to know itself. There's this tremendous mass of waves all over in space, which is the light bouncing around the room, going from one thing to the other, and it's all really there, really, really there. But you gotta stop and think about it, about the complex, and really get the pleasure. And it's all really there, really, really there. The inconceivable nature of nature. To think about all of this, to think about the vast emptiness of space. There's billions and billions of stars, billions and billions of specks. The beauty of a living thing is not the atoms that go into it, but the way those atoms are put together. The cosmos is also within us. We're made of star stuff. We are a way of the cosmos. And know itself. Across the sea of space, the stars are other sun. We've traveled this way before, and there is much to be learned.